Good morning, my name is Matt Clark. I'm assistant professor of practice in the art and art history department at the University of Texas in Arlington, where I'm also faculty director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Economic Innovation. I'm delighted to be part of Global Entrepreneurship Week and delighted to bring you this topic, UTA Maverick Diversity in Entrepreneurship. I have some of our brightest um, young entrepreneurs here with us today, who I'm just gonna let introduce your, themselves and then we'll get on talking about diversity and entrepreneurship. Victoria, good morning. Hi, good morning, how are you? Good, thank you. So my business is called Cordis Health Technologies. And what we do is basically create devices for rural health patients who suffer heart attacks so that um, their doctors who may be up to 70 miles away can get their data in close to real time so that maybe they won't have to drive several times to a big city to get their um, medical health checkup or whatever they need to. And you yeah. start you started this this company because of a you know a problem that you saw where you were growing up and, and a personal problem that you had yourself. Right. So I was born with a congenital heart defect and it only happens in like 0.03% of people. And I noticed growing up that a lot of people would have to come from like Lancaster County, which is where a lot of uh, rural areas is, are in um, Pennsylvania. And they would have to come all the way to Philadelphia to get their checkups. And it has to be like constant when you're young because it's not, you know, known how or what will change as you grow and whatever you eat and how much you weigh and everything can have an effect on your heart. And so, but when I moved here to Texas, when I started my graduate studies, I noticed that again. And, um, but it seemed to be more prevalent because here in uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, it's a large city, but it helps um, cater to a whole bunch of people that are very, very far away that may have to travel like hours to get here just so that they can see their doctor. And um, I had this opportunity to start something and it ended, it started as like a little project to see how it would go. And it worked out and I didn't expect it to work out, but um, so now it, it means a lot to me. And I think this is an important issue that needs to be discussed. That's fantastic. And you're also a, a currently a PhD student, a PhD student right now, right? Correct. I'm getting my PhD in bioengineering at UTA. So hopefully I'll graduate soon. <laughs> fantastic. Cindy, tell us about yourself and your business. Sure. I'm Cindy Braun, CEO and founder of The Social Robin. I started the company in 2017, um, and the company is a full-service marketing company, but essentially what we do is we form-fit our team in order to fit the needs of our clients. So if it's a new startup, which is a, an amazing team of one who needs branding and print and all of those different things that are really important to market your business, we can help that individual, but if we have someone like the Ritz Carlton um, who really needs everything, so videography and social media and, and really the whole kit, we are able to help them as well. So we just kind of scale our business to fit whoever we need to work with. And, and where and when did you discover entrepreneurship? I actually started my very first business while I was going to school at UTA full time and working full time. I decided, hey, why not start a business? while I was doing all of that. Um, so I started a, my very first business was actually sewing uh, parrot huts, which may not make sense, but they're like these little warm things for parrots to kind of go in and cozy up at night so they don't freeze. So I actually, I did that. So it was very time consuming because you have to sew, but that was my first um, kind of test company where I really learned a lot about online sales, um, integrity, perseverance, <laughs> and time management. Uh, so I, that was my very first business. It only lasted about a year um, because I got so busy and I had to sew so much that I could not dedicate that time to school and work. So I had to shut it down so that I could finish graduate school. <laughs> Interesting. That's great. Yep. Thank you. And Farha, <laughs> tell us about you and your business. What's going on? Uh, I'm Farha Jmain, the co-founder and CEO of Canna. Um, we've built an integrated hiring training and platform for the legal cannabis industry. 
essentially what we do is we help people get access to really incredible courses that teach them about the different trades in cannabis, get certified, find their first job on the employer side. We provide them with a really powerful HR platform to manage their workforce. And what's interesting about your, your business, Farhash, is it, it grew out of something else that you started at UTA. Yeah, yeah. So I went to UTA for about three and a half years. Um, and, you know, while I was there towards the end of my time, uh, got inspired to, you know, work on my first startup because of the map pitch composition. Uh, and that was a personalized barber booking marketplace company called Fade. Um, long story short, I ended up ultimately dropping out, going in on the company full time and you know, right when we were about to take off, you know, the market trends decided otherwise. So while I was in the process of figuring out what to do next, again, funny enough, another UTA alumni who was a close friend of ours gave us a call and said, you know, he needed help at his legal cannabis farm. Uh, and that was our aha moment. And it's been going pretty crazy since then. That's wonderful. And I also remember when I first talked to you that you have this, this, um, attitude of never giving up didn't you enter like the mad pitch competition four times or something before you i five. took four l's before my first check <laughs> <laughs> that's uh that shows that initiative and perseverance that is is part of uh, you know all entrepreneurs dna so what i thought i would do now is just kind of paint the landscape of diversity from some facts that i uncovered and then we'll get talking about maybe diversity first we can maybe talk about it at uta <clears throat> So what I've discovered or, or found and uncovered, 40% of new entrepreneurs in the U.S. are women. 64% of that are, owned by, are started by uh, colored women. 30% of new entrepreneurs in the U.S. are immigrants. And a lot of people start their businesses in college, 36%. And I know all of you have, so 100% in this talk today. <laughs> Though the funding sounds uh, is pretty short and the access to capital, it seems problematic. In 2019, female founded companies received only 2.7% of total capital invested in ventured back business in the US. Worse for Latinos and black. 1.8% for Latinos, only 1% for black people. Now, it's obviously that young people want to start their own businesses. 65% of young people said they want to start their businesses. But there seems to be this kind of barrier for entry for a lot of people. What I see, though, at, at UTA is this great um, ecosystem and community and culture that's still expanding and building. And since that's really where you got your, your start in entrepreneurship, where you got your feet wet, maybe you guys could talk about your experiences there and if there were any overlap in, in diversity uh, in your experiences with the beginning of your kind of entrepreneurial journey while at UTA. Cindy, do you want to start off with that? Sure. You know, it was a different business that I had started whenever I was at UTA, but I was learning a lot. I was learning a lot in the business world. So my degree, I did the dual degree program. I did the Master of Science in Human Resources as well as business. And so for me, um, going through both of those programs, it really gave me the confidence, I think, that I needed to say, OK, well, not only do I understand the business side, but I also know how to help manage people. And I also not just manage them, but understand them and understand what's important to them. And so for me, a lot of it was confidence. And so at the time in college, honestly, I, I did not, I never went to college to be, to network or to be social. Um, I was in college because I had goals. <laughs> so I was trying to get my graduate degree. I wasn't necessarily there to make friends. But what did happen is I did make a couple of really valuable friendships. Um, and those individuals have been there kind of along the way, um, both as friends, but also I have also developed colleagues, which ended up hiring me later on um, before I started the social Robin. And so a lot of those different things are not, not just connections, but it's inspiration and it's learning and it's confidence. And all of those things combined over time, especially, gave me a lot of confidence that I needed to feel like I wasn't going to be suppressed by those barriers that you speak about. Wonderful. Yeah. Well, how about you, Farage? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it's really interesting. You know, the number one problem that not just founders of color, but most founders in general face is in having access to capital. It is in closing your first enterprise contract. It's overcoming imposter syndrome. 
to be able to find the belief in yourself to understand that you can build something that scales into that will put you know money on other people's table downstream and you know really build a business that scales upwards. Um, you know, fortunately, UTA, you know, I, I, what's the statistic? It's the fifth most diverse campus in the United States. Um, it was a very inclusive community. And even with the startup programs like the Deep Dive uh, and a lot of the other things that are going on at the Startup Lounge to the pitch competitions, um, I think, you know, for a, a young 19, 20 year old kid who was taking his first foray into building a venture of his own, um, they made it very accessible to dream big and, you know, run my ideas through the trial by fire to figure out like exactly how we can make it work and get to viability as soon as possible with brutally honest feedback. So I appreciated that a lot. It helped me build a community of awesome people around myself in the Dallas Fort Worth community, uh, startup community, and also find one of my best founder friends, Tyler Sickles, who, you know, I still build companies along with today. So um, I, I really enjoyed that experience. And I think that how inclusive it was definitely gave me the strength to go out there and, you know, put put my foot out on the ground. That's great to hear. How about your experience, Victoria? Well, when I first got here, um, I was talking to one of my parents and I was saying how I was the only like female in the lab that I was working in and everyone else was uh, basically from another country. And they, were, they said something like, what are you working in, the UN? Was, <laughs> and so, <laughs> Like that was semi shock for me because I haven't had that experience before, but I found it being really, um, I guess, enlightening because there's so many different people from different backgrounds that have, because of what they've gone through or how they grew up, have different perspectives on things. And so by coming to UTA and doing the MAV pitch um, competition, it's a competition that tries to connect engineering and um, the business side so that we can come together to make some awesome project. And so that really is another way to diversify this is people who have like one way of thinking sometimes just don't see things the way that other people see it. And so by combining teams with like business majors, it really uh, helped a lot more than I thought it would. And speaking to the imposter syndrome, as someone who uh, is, I guess, more on the nervous side of really going out there, I definitely thought that maybe this won't work. Like, I don't know if I'll have, you know, time or if people will actually believe in, like, my company's mission or what we stand for or why we're doing this. And so the different professors that I've gone through, they have just continued to encourage me, even when I thought that. I don't know anything about what I'm doing. I just have um, this idea that I know can work. And I started building it up and they've really, they've really helped me a lot. And I appreciate that more than I think they know. <laughs> you guys have all kind of talked about this, this idea of inclusivity, which is, you know, the opposite, um, something that I've kind of looked at and thought about quite a bit. In that, were there anything in particular? You talked a lot about the resources that are at UTA, the Mav Pitch, um, the Deep Dive, the Epic Maps. Was there anything that that helped things kind of gel together for you guys when you were starting? That that made you feel part of a community or something that was greater that really kind of propelled you. You you talked about overcoming the imposter syndrome. You talked about getting. Um, further help and mentorship from some of your professors was it was it a group of things or was it any one thing that really helped kind of propel you forward as you were navigating this you know uncharted territory victoria well um for me i think it what really solidified everything was one professor dr mcgee in the college of business he at first seemed to believe more in my uh, business than I did in the beginning because I've been like oh I don't know if this is going to work out but he he really wanted me to meet with him and show me that this is possible and um, that I really appreciate that and he showed me like the basic business uh, pitch deck and um, a bunch of different ways to uh, show data that is relevant to investors or the Mav pitch competition. And so by him allowing or inviting me to meet with him multiple times and and just talk about how this could work 
and seemed feasible, it, re- it really helped the inclusivity of being an engineer and talking to someone who is a completely different mindset and still wanting me to succeed just at a different area of the university. And I think that really, that really helped me. Cindy or Farhash, do you have any anything else to add? Um, I think for me, since I, I didn't necessarily have access to all those really cool things that y'all are talking about, um, but for me, um, you know, being in the program that I was in, all of those classes are very diverse just to begin with. And that to just have that and be in a place where I see myself and I see others than myself, it's just, it's heartwarming and it's compelling in the way that you know, we're all here together and we're all here to learn and we're all moving towards the same goal. And I think just even to see either yourself or to see others from other areas and learn where they're coming from, hear their ideas or when they give presentations or you're assigned to a group project and just really understanding their points of view and knowing that there are different points of view and also that yours does matter. And it all kind of works together seamlessly in whatever project that you're working on. Um, I think those in-person experiences and just visually taking that in and mentally taking that in, that was really important for me for all of those situations. So although I didn't have those experiences, um, that they had with those programs, I did have the experience just just working with people. And I think that was really important with me. Thank you. Farhan, mm-hmm. Shabak? Yeah, I kind of tackle the broad point I made earlier. You know, it was the it was a community for me. Um, being able to find peers who were in the same wavelength, uh, to be able to go to the same events with them, to kind of network and, you know, build that, you know, spider web of people that we knew each other should meet with. And, you know, to be able to build together was huge. Uh, because, you know, we were able to share newer perspectives and learn from each other. So uh, that's what I'm most appreciative from, from my experience being at UTA. On the flip side, it had to be pretty um, challenging and daunting starting off when you discover, hey, I've got an idea and maybe there's something to this idea. What, what, what are some of the most challenging aspects of being in that space? that you guys had when you were just starting off as entrepreneurs? Farhash? Yeah, I could definitely talk to that. Um, you know, it was it was interesting because, you know, I was 20 years old and taking a bet on something and investing a lot of my time when most of my friends were out there socializing. Um, you know, it, it definitely felt like I didn't, you know, for the larger community of the people that I was around, uh, the belief that they would have in the product that I'm building versus my own. Uh, and the people that I was able to rally together to achieve that was very difficult, uh, especially when you're pretty young. And, you know, on the other side, you know, I was a university student who was kind of in the early stage of building his company. I'm like a, a queer immigrant founder of color building a company in the cannabis space. It's narrative violation 101. So <laughs> consistently from time and time over again, from pitch competitions to investor rooms to venture capital meetings, you know, there were a lot of times where I went through situations where I was marginalized or I knew that, you know, people weren't really hearing me out. But what that inspired me to do is to really break out of the small network that I had in Arlington and start to build a global network of people who were very involved in the in the startup scene and, you know, actually learn as aggressively as I could from them. And, you know, let alone in a couple of months, I, I, I started to be able to really build out the company, find the right investors and, you know, be able to drop out and have a, a team of 13 that I can make payroll for every month. So, yeah, it's, it's definitely been an interesting journey. But, you know, to your point earlier, Matt, um, I, I absolutely recognize the, you know, the the real imbalance and implicit bias when it comes to actual inclusion in the startup ecosystem. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of work for us to do there. Thank you. Victoria. I would say that there are barriers just in, like, the science field in general, because that's mostly a male dominated uh, field. So coming in as a woman who may be acting more on like feelings because she is, you know, um, affected by this personally also, but they might see that as a way of, oh, she just cares. She doesn't actually have the actual knowledge. And that's kind of how some of the people like, even like some of my friends have said like, they don't understand why I would want to do that or have 
the knowledge to do that. And it's kind of very like disheartening when you hear that. But at the same time, I have gone through a whole lot of stuff in my life and I just want to prove everyone wrong that I can do like whatever I want to do, whether it's make a business or get a graduate degree or run a marathon, which I don't plan on doing, but <laughs> um, it's hard it's, on the uh, knees. Yeah, it's definitely hard on the knees and uh, that doesn't sound like fun, but <laughs> When it sounds like some of these 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 barriers or these challenges that both of you guys have faced have propelled you on, have been kind of a motivating factor behind that. Was that something for you, Cindy, that happened? Was that a motivating factor? Oh yeah, that's been my motivating factor for my entire life. Um, the very first time actually that I went to community college, I asked them, um, I said, you know, hey, I, I, I work full time, but I need to, I need to keep that job. Um, but I also want to finish, you know, my degree from start to finish in about six and a half years all the way to my two master's degrees. And the lady looked at me and she said, well, you can't do that. You can't you can't take more than, you know, five classes in a semester and be successful and do well. And so I took that and I was like, yes, I can. <laughs> and so I did. And so, you know, from then forward, that's kind of been my mentality going on in most of the things that I try to achieve in life where someone tells me, no, you can't do it. Um, really, it's that you have to show that it is possible for people before people can begin to believe um, that it is possible for you to do. And for me, you know, I would say similar to Victoria, the marketing world, especially for marketing CEOs, is largely male dominated as well. Um, and it is very hard to have other people take you seriously unless you are able to show them. So. For me, I feel like I have to work three times as hard to prove myself, to prove my team, to prove my knowledge, because I think, or at least I have felt that coming in to any kind of discussion for marketing um, or for any really strategic meetings, I have to first show that I can you know, walk the walk and talk the talk before them auto automatically knowing that I know it because of my role just in general. So I do feel like I have to work a lot harder to prove myself, but I definitely, I definitely make an effort to do that. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. jump forward to now, how, how are you guys, do you experience much bias or barriers as you're continuing to, to grow the business and look towards the future? And what, what are those that, that you're, you're kind of the barriers or blocks that you're kind of coming up with? Anybody well, just... I know for me, oh, uh, for me, I know that in the beginning, um, my PI, my uh, principal investigator that I work under, he was not too excited because he thought it would take away from my research. But um, he eventually saw that this could be a good thing for his lab because it can show that I can do multiple things and still have time to be successful in the lab and be successful outside of the lab. And so initially that was very well, a large barrier that I felt I had to like pick and choose to go beyond and accomplish. But um, I'm still in the early stages, but I feel like a lot of people are now starting to believe in me just by hearing my pitch instead of just um, hearing my pitch and then some or hearing like my background in education and whatever. So I feel like because I'm slowly moving forward, I'm building a better reputation that is counter to what people might expect. And so I think that's a that's really what's helping me move forward. How about you, Cindy? Some ongoing bias or barriers? Um, I would say it's still difficult at times. I still do have to have that, you know, here's what I know before um, I can really be judged in my spaces. Oh, okay, she does know what she's talking about. Um, but, you know, in general, it's gotten much better over time. So that's good. And I think kind of, again, to Victoria's point, having that kind of reputation that people can see is really great. And I think also I've done a, hard, a lot of hard work on personal branding. So, you know, how do I show up to a meeting and how do I speak with people and how do I help them understand that I'm listening to them? Um, I've done a lot of work on that side to really help 
um, facilitate my expertise and how I show up whenever I do. And that really has helped me kind of make a lot of headway um, with some of, some of those underlying maybe generalizations that might come into a meeting with me. Right. Yeah. Great. And how about you, Farhaj? Yeah, you know, for like the first two and a half years when I worked in my last company, Fade, I thought that my personal brand had to be a direct representation of our company's kind of core thesis. Mm -hmm. So I'd be the guy who'd get a haircut every weekend, come in the most dapper suit, go to the rooms, dress really fly, and still get turned down. And I couldn't really crack the case for a long time, but it was somewhere around, you know, towards the end of that process that I just realized like I had to reclaim my narrative. And, you know, the only thing that matters build a good business. Some of them a founder can, that can see this through and I'm able to meet the expectations and the results that these investors are hoping for. So I just kind of went into an like accelerated learning experience, learning as much as I can about fund structures, you know, the levers, the incentives for VCs, you know, for angels and how like to actually build a sophisticated marketplace network. You know, uh, this information wasn't accessible a long time ago, even five years ago, but now it's become democratized where you can go to the people who've built multi-billion dollar businesses and learn as much about their experiences as you can from books to medium articles. Uh, and that was like a, you know, a quantum <laughs> shift in my life. Uh, you know, now I'm the guy who wears ripped jeans with his knees out, uh, you know, kids of immigrants hoodie, a hat and gets into a meeting and I can drive narratives forward and have people paying attention to what I have to say and getting to know Zanias is both as fast as I can. So, um, you know, I think, Again, coming back to imposter syndrome, that's one of the hardest things to beat. But at the end of the day, you understand the fact that you are the subject matter expert of your destiny because you see the world a little differently. Uh, and, and that's a narrative violation that you're willing to take a bet on. Uh, and coming to that understanding has, for the most part so far, um, eliminated a lot of the subconscious bias I used to face previously because, you know, of my credentials and, you know, what I'm looking forward to doing. That's great. And it makes me think about you on you young millennials. I don't know. I think some of you guys are millennials have really kind of opened up conversations. So I, 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 I have to thank you guys because it seems that your generation really has been this drive for change and acceptance and inclusivity. And another fact that I found that are everybody knows this, you know, millennials are more interested in social impact now so they want to buy from companies that 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 have that in their mission and part of that is diversity so it's really nice to see that it's been driven by by you guys the you know the future of our country and our world so that's wonderful for me to finally put that together and say wait a second it's you guys that are making us all woke right <laughs> we try <laughs> So obviously we, we've seen, you know, there's some systematic and unintentional bias. Uh, one thing that I read and uncovered was this, this idea of pattern matching. And I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but pattern matches are, are investors will invest in stuff that has worked before. And as we see, venture capitalists, the guys, the people that are investing money are typically white guys because that's been the standard and they've typically invested in white founded businesses before and i guess how do we change that that culture you know i also uncovered only three percent of those venture firms three percent of who they employ are either latino or black so there's still this inequity in, in in the the access to capital and even who's in, involved in that capital, uh, how do we see some of these systematic things changing? Because you know it's a system that continually rewards a specific type of entrepreneur and traditionally has pushed out others. Now we see the change, and I, I think the real change is happening. Like I said, from your generation. How much of that are, are you guys feeling? How much of these problems are are, are opening doors now that were problematic in the past? I mean, you guys are all still moving forward, still successful. That's pretty exciting. And if you look at 15 years ago, 20 years ago, would that have been a possibility? I don't know. So do you see that tide kind of changing that I'm talking about? 
and how is it changing um, to become more inclusive? Anybody have any thoughts on that? Well, I think for a lot of us, I mean, we have to do stuff ourselves in order to prove ourselves. So um, I think all of our stories have some element of that. Um, just saying, okay, I'm here and I'm going to do what I set out to do. I believe in myself most of the time, but I'm going to do what I set out to do. And I think, you know, with that, we also know that we can't depend because just like your stats say, we can't depend on other people to provide us the capital that we're looking for. We have to make that happen for ourselves. So we don't sit around and wait um, in order to take action to get to where we need to go and to achieve our goals. We go ahead and we keep moving. And so I think maybe that's probably an important element is we're going to keep going. And then at some point, that's going to match with some of these, you know, angel investors or venture capitalists, and they're not going to be able to ignore us at some point. Um, but we're not going to let that keep us down. That's great. Anything to add, Victoria or Farhash? I would definitely agree. I think it might take a bit, little bit longer than um, we would like. But I think it's definitely going to happen, especially with our generation who is who are so motivated to create this type of change and um, not having it just in one sector or one part of the country, but uh, all across the United States. And I know for me, I kind of had this like I've always been a tomboy. And so I usually just wear like a pantsuit kind of thing when I go to something professional. But I went to get. Uh, new clothes recently and I decided to embrace my femininity and it kind of made me feel more I don't know powerful in a way like wearing a dress with my heels and looking all like pretty and stuff but I was still able to you know show that I am smart and able to do all these different things so it's not I wasn't trying to hide as much with the other male dominated people in wherever I was and I think that was a really big moment for me to just show that, yeah, I could blend in, but I'm choosing to wear brighter colors or something more like traditionally feminine. And it, I think people were taken aback by it at first. <laughs> I think it ended up being a good thing because you got positive attention and um, you were able to show that you know what you're doing. And so... I think that was that was a really good experience. And so I think we just need to do those small things that will eventually lead to a larger movement of people accepting who they are or uh, wanting to change a systemic issue and um, really believing in themselves so that they can do it themselves. Victoria, I just want to say I love that for you and we stand, okay? <laughs> we stand. Um, but yeah, I, I do a lot of work, like specifically in underestimated, like venture capital, founder startup ecosystems. It's something that's near and dear to my heart. You know, from my perspective, there has to be a big bifurcation of effort on both sides, top down for venture capital, where they actually actively proactively go and hire, you know, because, you know, I refuse to believe that diversity is a pipeline problem. Like, you know, pardon my friends, but that's, that's, uh, that's BS. Um, you know, there are a lot of incredible founders, investors, people who are putting themselves through the track and building up a really good, you know, credential system, you know, from the experience that they've gained over time looking for these opportunities. It's if the venture capital funds are proactively going and finding people of color, you know, women, you know, people who are gender fluid to be a part, to actually make their diverse, you know, their perspective more diverse, because honestly, they're missing out on the long tail if they don't. Um, on the other side, for founders, I think for the most part, you know, unlike your Stanford, you know, business school and Harvard Business School grads where they have, you know, Peter Thiel and all these amazing people who come in and just give out their mind share for them for free every single day of the week. You know, most founders of color don't have access to this kind of education, uh, you know, to become sophisticated and to understand exactly how to build companies that can scale really fast and how to also, you know, to your word, Matt, pattern match to their expectations. So, you know, now a lot of legwork is being done from Y Combinator Startup School. Like even in Texas, there are organizations like, you know, Div Inc., which is an accelerator uh, for pre-seed companies who were founded by founder of, founders of color and women, Impact Ventures in Dallas. There are a lot more organizations that aren't just making the effort, but they are, you know, writing the check, making the hires and sending the wires. So we need to proactively invest in a lot more of that. 
And I think we need to start to be able to, you know, be more intentional about who we let into our companies ourselves. You know, for me, I had pre like pretty much like decided on exactly what my cap table is going to look like. And mm-hmm. I've said no to a lot of investors just because they were just old white dudes with money and had nothing else to offer. You know, I wanted expertise. I wanted people that on doomsday and, you know, have them listen out to me, hear all my problems, give me advice. And I wanted people who understood that, you know, cannabis has systemically disenfranchised black and brown people, you know, for, for decades and decades and put them in jail and, you know, dissolved a lot of equity that was possible. And now when we look at the, the equity and the distribution of wealth, you know, for an industry that brings in 30 billion a year, 81% of it is owned by all white dudes. So if we need to break the imaginary glass ceiling, then we have to have all of those perspectives and we have to be intentional about who we let in. But again, to be intentional about the investors that you get to choose, you know, you as a founder have to have the ability to, to drive that forward. So education on the founder side, you know, having a lot more access to that, I think is crucial. And on the investment landscape side, I think they have to be a lot more intentional about the people that they hire and the bets that they make in the long term. Right. I yeah. love hearing these solutions from you guys. You know, I did a, a, some more digging and it happens that in this uh, month, Dallas luxury or one of those rag mags, they're talking about the cowboy player, Jalen Smith. Smart guy, graduated from Notre Dame, entrepreneur. He has an uh, eyeglass line. He put $2.5 million to fund a minority-backed entrepreneurship in, in initiative. It's called the Minority Entrepreneurship Institute. So it looks like this, this thing's already coming, and it's great to see people like that who have a big public voice um, really putting his name behind something and his money too. And then I've seen other things like a Change Catalyst and New Me Startup Accelerator, which are also minority involved um, startups and funds. Another question, I I love you guys talking about how you're using a lot of this to empower yourselves, how you're overcoming the imposter syndrome. But the entrepreneurial ecosystem is full of alphas, right? Alpha people typically. And and, and that's going to automatically probably make you nervous just because you're dealing with that kind of mentality. How conscious of are you guys of these gender, cultural, um, national um, biases as you navigate um, through this kind of entrepreneurial journey that you guys are on? Is it is it in the top of your minds or is it just come up when you notice it? I think it's always there, um, at least in my in my experience, everything is always there, especially I think if you're a minority, there are a set of things that you experience throughout your life where you are just aware of the situation you're in um, at any given time. And so for me, um, you know, when I step into a room, be it whoever it is, I already know. Uh, what the temperature is, how I need to speak from an attitudes and behavior standpoint. I have already created my chameleon personality that I can do best in that room. Um, I guess for better or worse, I've developed that skill set over time, just having to kind of move forward through the situations that I've been put in, just being an entrepreneur myself. And so um, to be able to kind of move left and right from a behavioral standpoint has been really helpful for me. But I am always aware of that. I mean, there's not a there's not a point where I'm not always self-aware for almost everything that I do. And so um, it's although I don't see it as exhausting at this point, I mean, everything has a silver lining. So I've just really built my um, my personability skills just that much higher um, with that experience. But I mean, yes, it's not great that I've had to do that. But um, at the very least, I have been able to adapt myself to pretty much any situation with any people because of the level of self-awareness that I've had to have. So it's almost part of the, your DNA now that you just do it yes. because of an automatic response. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Victoria Farhash? Well, I think I can definitely relate to that chameleon type of personality, especially when you're about to present your idea or... Um, um, give a talk about what you're about to do. You see all these people who know just what they see, and then you have to kind of adapt and read the body language and um, 
the, the temperature in the room, as you said, and figure out, okay, this is kind of how I have to act in order to have them accept me and my idea and what my, my purpose is here. But I think it's, um, especially as someone who is not an alpha person, uh, it's, it can be very difficult to put on that strong personality that I'm not used to doing, but it's, it's, uh, it's very, I guess, helpful in a way to let me like grow in a different uh, version of myself. Cause I, even though you all have like different versions with your friends and your family and your potential businesses, they all somehow merge together to create who you are. So I think the environment is definitely challenging, but with the different types of personalities, I think it can help you a little bit more to grow, if that makes sense. Or hard. How about you? Yeah. Um, you know, I think I've, I've been a little fortunate. You know, early on in my startup career, I kind of did build this like you know facade this person that Farhad was from room to room that he worked in but towards the end uh you know I, I had a company that failed and i had to wind down that was pretty much my identity and you know, i went through that existential crisis you know failed company failed founder dropout you know brown people's children <laughs> engineering degree non-existent uh and you know while i was going through the process the two things i was able to do that i'm very grateful for today is first kind of center my identity back and lean in to be unapologetically myself uh, and then the second thing was, you know, which people don't talk about is find a therapist. Um, you know, starting a company is really effing hard. Uh, you know, it's a fast paced environment every single day, especially if you're fundraising, the emotional output that you put out there to keep a consistent cadence and tell the same story over and over and over and over again, thousands of times with the same amount of passion, you know, with the same amount of expectations of the end result while you're managing all of these different things is, uh, is draining, you know, regardless of how much of an extrovert you are, which I am. Um, so, you know, the one thing that I'm very bullish on is that, you know, we we should be a lot more, we should be talking a lot more openly about, you know, the struggles of what building a company looks like. We should be sharing our failures a lot more often so that people can learn those things and avoid them at all costs. You know, nobody has to go through the, the, the generational trauma that, you know, we went through during our process of building a company. Um, so, and also, you know, mental health is very important in this space because, you know, there's just so much on your shoulders. So those are the two things I was very fortunate to be able to lean into and, you know, holistically, emotionally, I'd say, you know, even with the world being upside down this year that I've been able to preserve a really good headspace and, and just be out there, you know, being Farhaj and building this company and understanding that, you know, Canna and Farhaj are mutually exclusive, uh, but we just work really well together. Um, so that's my perspective on you know, the whole, whole nine yards. And, and it's so great that you bring up mental health and wellness, because I think it's something we, we often forget about when we talk about entrepreneurship, but it's so vital because you do have to pull so many things out of the reserves, so to speak. And, and you know, if you don't have a sound mind, how are you going to have a sound business? And just, you know, just when I started listening to your stories, it sounds like you guys have time managed, but kind of down pretty well for the most part. And if you talk to students across the board, most students have huge challenges with time management. I remember talking with, with some of you in the beginning about this idea of also giving back. You know, you're, you're entrepreneurs because you want to make impact and change. But I think that both all of you probably want to give back because you've been fortunate and you've had this, this interesting path and journey. What are some things that you guys could do to give back to create a better, more inclusive ecosystem that, that starts to break down these, these barriers or, or walls that you guys have faced? How can you help these, these future entrepreneurs not have to um, maybe go through some of the challenges or hardships that you had? I think leading by example is definitely one of the most important things to do. Um, for my team especially, um, you know, whenever they're first hired, I generally like to tell them probably what they don't want to hear. And I say, hey, I know you're not going to be here with me forever. But when you do leave, I want to make sure that you leave having learned something new and being set up for success for whatever it is that you're going to do on your career journey. And so the way that I choose to give back, at least for now, 
um, is definitely in training and helping my own employees get set up for success for their futures. By and large, I would say about 80% of the individuals who come work for me, they definitely want to start their own business later. And so I am very vulnerable and very transparent in all the things that I do. Um, you know, during COVID, I definitely let them know how much we were struggling right when COVID hit. We all jointly made decisions for the team, for the better of the team. And I was very vocal about allowing them to have input and as far as some of the company decisions being made. And, and I understood all of their trials and tribulations. So we are all people from the mental health side. It's understanding that you're working with a lot of people who have different lives and different struggles. And so if they say they're having a bad day, cool. We all go have your bad day. It's fine. <laughs> I'm not going to punish you because, you know, you can't finish your work that day. We'll just, the team will help you and we'll get what needs to get done then. Um, but I think leading by example and being able to show them, you know, how we've been able to be successful, um, helping them understand where we failed and just giving them some guidance so that they don't make the same mistakes and then teaching them new skills that they can take with them in the future. Um, that's how I choose to kind of pay forward what I received from myself, from other people, mentors, professors at UTA. I can take all those nuggets of information and just deliver them vicariously through stuff that I've lived and help them that way. So that's how I choose to do it for now, at least. That's that's a great way of giving back. Yeah. Victoria, how about you? For me, I think um, I love learning about different cultures and different people. So I think I definitely plan on having multiple backgrounds come in because I've seen just going from the Northeast to Texas and UTA especially that diversity can totally change a project or a vision just because this one person has this one story that they grew up with or uh, this one incident that happened to them that may not have happened to me because of different circumstances. So I think definitely leading by example and being empathetic towards people and really trying to understand that um, they do have their own struggles or they do have their own personal barriers that they might need to um, overcome. And especially with mental health, I think our system kind of shows that we want you to have straight A's and um, you're kind of indoctrined into being this perfect student and doing sports and doing all these outside activities that we need to share our failures as much as we might not like it it's important to show that you can fail and still continue and uh, be successful because I know that was one of my biggest fears of starting something getting these the large amounts of money from people and then just failing them and I would be really disappointed in myself so I think that if we share that with um, our employees or future employees or just our friends and family we can give back in a way that helps people and they might not realize it or helps them and they can take that little nugget of information and apply it to themselves in their own way. That's great. And, and, and you know, Farhaj brought up this idea of not talking about things of, hey, we all know that a lot of startups fail. We all know that there's a huge challenge and bias and, and barriers at every place. But why isn't that being discussed? You know, we're, we're talking about transparency, really. But if we want full transparency, don't we have to talk about the messy and the bad, too? Because I know that you're all, all of your journeys and experiences have not been always great. I know that you've been told no many times, that you failed and had to close down businesses. And I think that maybe just by starting to be a little more transparent and, you know, I, I told my students about this, you know, hey, whatever side of the um, fence you decide to sit on, I don't care. But if you can't come and have a conversation about things civilly, we're in a lot of trouble. And I hope that we, we can start to just use this as a catalyst for more open-ended discussions about diversity and entrepreneurship. Looking back, thinking about your beginnings, anything you would do different when you started out? Use Twitter a lot more. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, it's crazy, but the entire startup and VC ecosystems on Twitter, a lot of my best friends that I would have never met otherwise, you know, half of the people that I've shared cocktails and meals with when I'm here in Venice Beach, you know, to investors who have actually put in money into my company, I met on Twitter. Uh, and it's a, it's a great place to build, you know, personal brand. Uh, the serendipity leads to a lot of amazing connections. And, you know, if I had, would have known sooner, I feel like I could have landed a product role at one of the top up and coming couple of months, you know, just freshman year of high school. Um, so that's definitely one thing that I wish I knew. And then also, you know, similar to your like t- the point about vulnerability, um, you know, openly talking about your failures is a very vulnerable position. Uh, you know, a lot of people like mustering up the courage to be able to do that is very hard. I kind of wrote this like open letter about me shutting down fade the experience, the learnings and, you know, why I was doing it uh, because I felt I just had to, to get it off of my chest. And it was one of the most rewarding experiences ever. You know, a lot of my best friends reached out. I got to catch up with a lot of old friends who went through similar journeys who weren't able to come out like that. And, you know, some of the investors who read that were the first ones to cut me a check of my next venture. Um, So, you know, I, I definitely think that, Having tough conversations as early as possible is amazing, uh, as long as you're in a comfortable position to lead those discussions. Yeah. yeah, for me, I would say having a, what I would do differently if I could would be having a real knowledgeable mentor. And what I mean by that is there are mentors who you could seek out, but they're not necessarily the greatest for your space, right? Um, the knowledgeable part, there are a lot of gurus out there who will spit whatever can sell you something, but that does not mean that they actually know what they're trying to say in the space or they don't necessarily know will actually help you. So finding a mentor that is knowledgeable and real, I think that would have been really important for me. Um, Saying that though, it is really hard to find, right? That's a really hard ask because just finding the person that can help you in your space is difficult. So I'm not sure if there's an avenue, I'm pretty sure there's probably an app for that at this point. But I would say if that's if that's easily attainable or if there's any way for you to get a mentor in your space that is real and knowledgeable, I think that would be highly useful to get you even further ahead than where you've already started. I, I totally agree. And and I don't know if you read the Wall Street Journal, but on Saturdays they have um, in the business section a board of advisors, like a CEO of a company, and then a little list of their board of advisors. So their advisors and mentors that they go to. So I always think that, hey, you probably always need to have more than one mentor because one person might be able to address this particular problem or need you have, and another person could probably do that. One of the tasks that I'm trying to do at UTA is really develop a strong uh, mentorship program for our entrepreneurs. So I might be tapping you guys in the future to help out because I know that um, your experience is um, valuable to the people that come after you. And that that's how we learn. And as you know, in entrepreneurship, it's all about the experience. That's where we learn. We learn through the failures and the grit and the grime. Um, yeah, yeah. Some other interesting insights, maybe not insights to you, states with the most diversity in cultural makeup have a higher rate of entrepreneurial activity. No surprise there, right? (laughs) Um, Here's a question. We're almost at the end here. For you, do cultural differences encourage more innovative, creative, and productive startups? Do you think these complementary could be complementary in skills and approaches? Oh, yeah, for sure. I think my biggest my biggest thing that I like to surround myself people or surround myself with are people who can poke holes. And I find that a lot of people from different backgrounds, cultures, they can poke the most holes of anybody. And so I can have my head way up here in the clouds and think that my idea is great. But until someone pokes holes into it, I can't see all the problems that it might have um, from either like the male perspective or any other perspective that I'm not really seeing it through. And so I think if you can find um diversity you can find you know multicultural people to help you what you're doing is you're helping people poke more holes and you're also just getting a wealth of information from different backgrounds that you never really would have thought about to begin with and more information is never bad any other comments after that 
I would tend to agree. I definitely think that having people with different backgrounds who are able to show you, well, maybe you can tweak it this way, or maybe you should add this other component, or um, maybe you should have this extra piece of information. It really will speak to this group of people. And I think that having like we can't experience everything as one person. So we have to collectively as a group bring our experiences together. And the more the group is, the better we will be able to reach out to the more people of different backgrounds or different ethnicities or different experiences. And so I think that surrounding yourself with people who can poke holes or question you or play the devil's advocate or just not just tell you what you want to hear is very important, especially in something like entrepreneurship, because hopefully you take it with a grain of salt and it won't like dunk or drag you down, but right. they will hopefully encourage you to be like, oh, maybe I didn't see it from that perspective. And that's a really good point. And you can add it into your business plan or add it into your product or whatever you're going to add it into. And I feel like that's very important. And that's what a lot of people are learning now. And I think that's a really good method to live by, I guess. That's great. Have any, any more comments from you, Farhash? Yeah, you know, I mean, I personally am very bullish on the fact that technology companies are the solution to democratizing access to both wealth and opportunities. The problem has been most of the teams that build these companies haven't been inclusive from the get go. You know, if you build the world's largest e-commerce company and have nobody who is personally affected by, you know, disabilities or have accessibility issues due to blindness, then what you don't realize is that 40 percent of the consumer base that exists in America is now somewhat excluded from being able to access your platform. And it's a net negative for both parties. You know, people who want to be able to take advantage of these technological solutions to better their lives and technology companies who want to drive towards more profit to build better offerings for their customers. So personally, you know, as somebody who identifies as a capitalist, I think that diverse teams are an absolute blessing and a way for companies to build moats early on around things like their brand, like their communities and definitely product from having unique insight. Uh, and you know, it would be a missed opportunity if you don't recognize now and invest heavily into making sure that you can catch up. And it's just so apparent that that it, it, you know inclusivity is now a must as we see it, as I'm sure you guys see your your customer base becoming more more diverse, more global. Uh, this is the way it's becoming. So you know, in my mind, this is just part of the the change and the uh, change for the good that's happening. Again, probably spurred by a lot of you young people, you know, because now I see diverse, diversity, you know, facilitates connectivity. Cindy, you were talking about, hey, it brings out new perspectives and new ideas, and pokes holes in things that you didn't think about. It seems to bring in uh, about innovation. And it seems to foster creativity. And, and I'm just delighted that you guys were here and, and shared your insights and thoughts with me today for Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, thank you. Thanks for the time and, and the words. I, I appreciate all of y'all for taking the time today. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome. No problem. Thanks for having me. Oh, before I leave, I just want to say one more thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> You know, for all of these social impact funds and everybody that's popping up, I just want to make sure that people are on the same page. You know, investing into a founder of color or an underestimated founder is not charity. Uh, I want you to see us as people who can return the whole damn fund. So, you know, keep that in mind and be a lot more, you know, intentional about how you see people, how you evaluate them and what kind of opportunities that you let them have. So, you know, we can return the whole damn fund. I believe in it. <laughs> Thanks so much for having us, Matt. That's a great way to end it. Thank you, guys.